Hello and welcome. I'm Jeunesse Castonguay, VP at Clarius. Thanks for joining us for today's live webinar, Ultrasound for Sports Medicine, guiding safe, accurate PRP injections in the elbow, knee, and back. You're among 1,600 clinicians who registered for this popular session. It's been exciting to work with sports medicine educator, Dr. Frank Johnson, to bring you today's dynamic event. And in a minute, you'll see why. Now, research shows that pain medicine injections performed blindly have a miss rate as high as 30%. Dr. Johnson will teach us how to use high resolution wireless ultrasound to improve the accuracy of our PRP injections, reduce the risk of complications, and deliver optimal pain relief for patients so they can get back on track and back in the game faster. And while he'll cover elbow, knee, and back PRP injections in depth, Dr. Johnson has loaded his presentation with lots of bonus content. Get ready for a value-packed session. And just before we get started, a housekeeping note, please do use the Q&A icon at any time to ask questions. We'll be addressing questions at the top of the hour following the presentation and live scanning session. Let me now introduce you to your host for today's webinar. Shelley Gunther is an experienced sonographer with over 25 years of experience. As clinical manager at Clarius, Shelley is dedicated to providing the highest quality educational content for clinicians looking to add wireless ultrasound to their practice, delivering practical webinars like today's and video tutorials for our Clarius classroom, which now features over 250 on-demand videos. Join me now in welcoming Shelley. Hi, Shelley. Hi, Janice. Thank you so much. And welcome everyone for uh, our first webinar with Dr. Frank Johnson, founder of Sport Medicine Ultrasound and Director of Education. I had the pleasure of spending a day uh, to observe several procedures he performed using wireless ultrasound to ensure the very best results for his patients. And several of those patients were actually returning customers and you could tell they were huge fans of Dr. Johnson's and of the work that he does. So before we get into the presentation, I, I wanted to present a few papers on the topic of ultrasound guided injections. This first one is a comprehensive review of the literature conducted to demonstrate increased accuracy of ultrasound guided injections, regardless of anatomic um, location. And the results show that ultrasound guided injections are overall more accurate than landmark guided injections, and that ultrasound guidance improves efficacy and cost effectiveness of uh, many injections. Uh, the next one is a retrospective review from the Asian Spine Journal, which involved all patients who underwent ultrasound-guided lumbar spine injection therapy at a single institution over a year. The patients were evaluated by two interventionists, um, one who then performed standardized ultrasound-guided lumbar facet joint and pararadicular spinal injections. And their experience confirms the safety, feasibility, and effectiveness of ultrasound-guided lumbar spinal injection for the treatment of axial and radicular pain, and the multiple benefits that using ultrasound to guide the injection provides. And finally, this systematic review from the Journal of Arthroscopy, Sports Medicine, and Rehabilitation that concluded ultrasound-guided injections were more accurate compared with blinded knee injections in every study. And the most accurate anatomical approach was superlateral, which I watched Dr. Johnson perform in his office, and that he'll be describing in more detail in his talk. Now, we'd like to know a little bit more about how or even if you are all using ultrasound to guide injection. So please take a moment just to answer this poll. How are you using it daily, weekly, monthly, or are you just learning today? So I'll give you a couple of more seconds to close out the poll three two, one. Great. So lots of you just learning today and lots of you are using it daily and, and then some a little bit of a mix in between. So I think for those learning today that you're going to find this really informative. And for those that are using it daily, it's going to be very affirming for you. So I'd like to introduce you now to Dr. Johnson, who is one of the only sports medicine doctors in Canada with the RMSK, uh, which is Registered Musculoskeletal Ultrasound Certificate. And let me tell you, he has some mad ultrasound skills. Dr. Johnson founded Sport Medicine Ultrasound in Canada in 2019 to teach ultrasound guided injections such as cortisone, PRP, visco supplement, neural hydrate dissection, and nerve blocks to sport medicine doctors, orthopedic surgeons, and emergency room docs. They run 12 to 24 courses per year for learners of all abilities. So he's a very busy man and we appreciate him taking the time today. I'll uh, let you take it away, Dr. Johnson. 
Well, thanks so much. And I'm really glad to be here today. And I'm also glad to see that poll, to see that a bunch of you are using it daily. And for those of you who are just learning today, um, there's a ton of information here. It might seem overwhelming, but we're here to take you by the hand and start you on your journey. So let's get started. I've just spent the last 24 hours in the Canadian Rockies with a buddy of mine who came in, uh, but I'm here to share with you some exciting developments in sports medicine ultrasound. Uh, I had to come up with a title for this. So I came up with something a little sing-songy, a little rhymey. I came up with elbow, back, hip, and knee, injections with PRP from A to Z. Now I'm in Canada, <laughs> we say Z. But anyway, there you go. Um, now, I, who am I? I'm one of the 15 sport medicine doctors at Canada's largest sport medicine clinic called Group 23. Now, about four years ago, we started an injection mentorship program for our junior doctors. And out of those training sessions was born Sport Medicine Ultrasound Canada. Now, since then, we've grown into one of the largest MSK injection training organizations in North America. Now, um, our objectives for today are to be entertained. We want to get inspired about adding more MSK injections to your practice. Um, we want to learn a little bit about the different types of PRP and how to use them. But we also want to see lots of examples about how to use cortisone, PRP, hyaluronic acid. But we also want to find for those, per, I think it was like 31% of you are just learning today. We want to find a pathway to start with MSK ultrasound. For those of you that use it daily, now I also wonder how many of you use it multiple times a day, and I bet that's a lot. Um, for those of you who know a ton, we want to uh, show you a pathway to really excel. Now, my own journey started back in 2015. Now, there was tons of stuff available. I could find YouTube videos and I could find textbooks, but I couldn't really find anything to help me learn ultrasound in a step-by-step -step fashion. Now, finally, in 2017, I found a group in the UK that was starting a mentorship program. Now, their courses were all live in-person courses. So I flew from Calgary to London, England eight times that year because I couldn't find anything else that would take me by the hand and lead me where I wanted to go. Since then, you know, we made some great friends. We all went on this journey together. We're still in contact to this day. Now, when I got back to Canada, I started an ultrasound training program. And then this year we're launching into the States. Now we've run all these courses since 2019. We've got one coming up in Ottawa in, uh, in, uh, in July. And now I put some important dates on. Now, Dr. John Jacobs, uh, is a sort of like a, sort of a godfather in MSK ultrasound, and he even did an online uh, webinar for us. So I'm super proud of my team. I'm super proud that we've put together an amazing course that people love. And over these last four years, I've, the, they've allowed me; these courses have allowed me to meet some amazing doctors and nurses who have all been inspired and want to add MSK ultrasound to their practice. And, uh, you know, here's a bunch of them we've been able to do football games, we've been able to go to concerts, we've been able to, you know, and learn something along the way, of course. So the point there is wherever you go, I want you to find a tribe, I want you to find your team to help you learn this stuff, because it's tough to learn on your own. We're launching into the States later this year. If you're an orthopedic surgeon on the call, we've got a brand uh, that caters directly to orthopedic surgeons. Um, now, teams I've had in the past. Now, again, we talked about objectives. We want to share a little bit of a smile. Um, I'm honored to be here. I want to share with you a little bit about the teams that I've been on in the past. And I want you to reflect on the teams you've been on in the past. And I want you to think about uh, how those, uh, those teams can you know, if you were to make a good solid ultrasound team around you, uh, how far you could get. Now, teamwork, team members I've been <laughs> teamed up with in the past are uh, Donald Duck and Goofy and Pinocchio. And of course, there's me on the cruise ship. Now, the team I have with me today is just as smiley as old, as old characters, but uh, not quite as well known. There's my team for the West Coast. Uh, there's my team for Central North America. And there's my team for Eastern North America. Now, my clinic in Calgary, uh, in total, uh, we've covered eight Olympic games, like literally eight different Olympic games. But the Clarius team is just as inspiring. The, when you go on the Clarius website, those on-demand videos, those Clarius classroom videos, um, uh, not only in the Clarius classroom, but in the testimonials, you can see surgeons, doctors, veterinarians, and physios from all over the world who, like you, are inspired by handheld ultrasound and what it might be able to bring to their practice and to their patients. 
So we're going to start with PRP. Now, when I run courses and people ask me about PRP, man, everyone is super keen on PRP. Now, I think it might be because it's a little bit of a, of a, uh, like a magic potion and people aren't quite sure how to cast that spell. So we're going to share a little bit with you uh, about that today. We're going to move on to elbow, back, buttock, hip, and knee. Now, um, now, just so you know, I am not just a needle jockey. I prescribe physio, I bracing, injections. Uh, we usually go with cortisone first before we move on to other things. So this is an aid that I use in my clinic. We start at the bottom and we work our way up. So I do have people that say, I want to go straight to surgery. I say, hold on, hold on. Why don't we try some physiotherapy first? <laughs> Why don't we try an injection first? Um, but uh, the best thing I've ever seen about PRP, this is a doctor from named Adam Anson on his website. You can see the link on his website. Uh, we're going to record this. You'll have access to it later. This is the best uh, artistic rendition of exactly what PRP is that I found in the literature. So it's definitely worthwhile uh, seeing if you can find that reference. Grab your phone, take a picture of it quickly. We're going to show it lots here. So this is what a plasma-based PRP preparation system looks like. So you spin it down and a lot of the platelets are floating in the top, but they're not very concentrated. We call this a yellow PRP in my clinic because uh, leukocyte poor kind of, it's kind of a jargony, you know, it kind of is a bit confusing to me anyways. So what it means is essentially uh, there's lots of platelets, but it's not very concentrated in the plasma, but it's also not very contaminated. It's super common for people to be able to get a two times concentration out of this. Now, what else is there? Well, there's other things like a buffy coat system. Now, the buffy coat systems are kind of a funny word. Um, I call them red PRP because down here in the bottom left, you see the erythrocytes, the purple things in the middle are the leukocytes, and the tiny little blue balls are the platelets. Now, what you can get with this, it's very concentrated, but it is also contaminated by those leukocytes and by the erythrocytes. So it comes out looking red, but you can get a highly concentrated version. So let's go over that one more time. The plasma-based systems give you a weaker concentration with no leukocytes. The buffy coat systems give you a more concentrated uh, product with some leukocytes and some erythrocytes. So it comes out looking red. So that's what is it. Now, how do I make it? So I want to know what, uh, if you're on the call and you're using PRP already, I want to know what systems you're using to make it. Now, one of my colleagues is running a, a PRP conference here in Canada, and he, he, he wonders what the most popular systems are in Canada. Now, I'm also on the board of directors of a PRP and prolotherapy and stem cell organization in Canada, so I know all the different systems that we have, but I'm really curious to see out of the users here, because I know we've got some in Asia, we've got some, some um, viewers uh, in Europe, some viewers in North North America. I want to see what those systems are. Um, now, obviously in the Q&A afterwards, if there's a really cool system in, uh, that's going to be available, it, like in your region, you want to share it, just type it into the sort of questions and we can get to it later. Um, so let's wrap up that poll there, Shelly. I'm interested to see uh, what the numbers look like. Oh, oh, we're going to show those at the end, aren't we? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so uh, how do I make it? So yeah, stick around for the end because we're going to show you those poll results at the end. So how do I make PRP? Well, um, there's some different systems here. So what do we have? So uh, the standard, most, uh, the least expensive way is one of these gel tubes. Now these gel tubes, we saw that, that's sort of a plasma-based system. So we know right out of the gate, this is not gonna get you any better than two times concentration. And Regen Lab is a Swiss company that makes their product in Switzerland. And on their website, they say, look, our product gives you a 1.6 times platelet concentration. Why? Because, well, you know, about 20, you only get about 80% of the platelets, about 20% are lost. Now, there's another system that's available, uh, you know, sort of modified by a doc in Manhattan named Greg, Greg Lutz, and it's, a, it's a, called the Key PRP system. This is also available in, um, in Europe, and it's more of a, a buffy coat system. Harvest is owned by a Japanese company called Terumo, and they're, they've been a leading player in the field for a long time. But then Arthrex. Arthrex is an orthopedic supply company, orthopedic device company all around the world. And on the left-hand side here, they do have sort of a plasma-based system that'll give you about a two times concentration. And on the right-hand side here, this is a super cool centrifuge, essentially with a light microscope uh, in there. So you can actually punch in how many red cells you want how many uh, yellow cells you want, how many platelets, and it'll spit it out. And it's a remarkably cool piece of kit. So 
I want now to let you know that in our upcoming sportsmedus.com PRP certification, we'll literally take you by the hand and work you through how to choose the right patient, the system, the dose of platelets you give your patient, the right way to inject, uh, but then also how to rehab them afterwards and how to manage poor outcomes because poor outcomes do happen from time to time. Now, how do I use it? Nah, now that is why you buy one of these little puppies and make sure you put your injection in the right place. Okay, so let's move on to elbow tendon. Now using an elbow, for an elbow tendon, I'll usually use the L15 scanner. It's a high frequency, most appropriate scanner for superficial targets, especially for sports medicine. Now, uh, Shelly, I think we've got our, or Rod, we've got a poll here because I wanna know what you find the most helpful for medial or lateral, whether it's medial or lateral, elbow tendon pain. Again, I know it's a broad question, Sometimes the answer is surgery, <laughs> but I want to know, you know, do you find PRP to be highly effective in your patient group or how about cortisone? I mean, cortisone is still, I think you go to any country in the world, cortisone gets used for these, but a lot of us who use ultrasound are starting to say, you know, there might be a time and a place where cortisone is appropriate, but I want to start offering PRP or other regenerative treatments to my patients sooner rather than later. You know, there's plain old tenotomy where you literally take a needle and you pass it through the tendon like 20, 30 times. And a lot of studies say that can give you similar results to either PRP or surgery. So um, why don't we close off that poll? We'll show you the results at the end. I'm certainly curious to see what people uh, think about that. So let's move on to the next slide here. So this is what it looks like in my clinic when I do a golfer's elbow, or at least that's what we call it in North America, uh, a medial epicondyle tendon, the common flexor origin injection. So what we see here, um, we see the L15 scanner. Now, uh, right in the center of the screen, we see a sort of a little lump. Now that lump is of course the medial epicondyle of uh, the humerus. On the right-hand side is the musculature of the forearm. So how do you find the ulnar nerve? So this is the one question when I teach my courses, they say, where's the ulnar nerve? So it's that white circle right in the center or the black circle with sort of the white top on it. And it's, it's literally hiding behind the medial epicondyle. Now, of course, in some people it subluxates, especially when you bend to 90 degrees and what that would look like is if you have the elbow bent at 90 degrees and the uh, ulnar nerve is sitting there, there's going to be something between the tendon and the skin that is circular. And you just have to think, what is that? And you go around the corner and you find the ulnar nerve. Now, this is a small bit of dilute anesthetic. Now, some, some folks on the call may say, no, you don't put anesthetic in PRP. Well, in my practice, what I do is I, I, I said, I'm going to put in a dilute 0.1% lidocaine to improve the patient's comfort during the treatment. And some of the docs I, I work with use 1% lidocaine. Some refuse to use lidocaine. For me, I, I think putting in 0.1% is likely okay and doesn't affect the treatment too much. Now here's the PRP in the syringe. It's a 25 gauge, 1.5 inch needle, and it's coming in from the right hand side. And it's gonna make several passes through the tendon. Now, if I used an 18 gauge needle, it would shine beautifully using the ultrasound machine, but I think that's a little overkill. I think that's a little too big. And so the challenge is sometimes with ultrasound, you can't see the, the needle that well. But again, with a superficial structure like that, we know exactly where we are. We know where our safety is. We, we know where that ulnar nerve is. So we know where our danger area is and how we can stay away from it. Now, here's an example that I shot on my own with subtitles showing a lateral epicondyle injection. So what we see here on the screen, now we see the Clarius L15 scanner hooked up to my Android tablet. I've got this little gooseneck stand and it sits there. Um, I don't like putting the, the tablet on a Mayo stand or on a desk or something or having my nurse hold it. Here we see the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. Here we see the radial head. Now between them is a little bit of cartilage. Now up top is the common extensor portion of that, uh, that tissue. And now we're gonna go through it one more time because there's actually some ligament in here. Now the pink again is the tendon and at the bottom, it doesn't look any different, but this isn't tendon, this is the radial collateral ligament. Now, of course, it's gonna continue around the radial head, but you get the concept. The top half is tendon, the bottom half is ligament. 
So the nice thing with ultrasound is I can see if the patient has a radial collateral ligament tear, that is the cause of their tennis elbow. I can see if they have a tear in the common extensor tendon, that top portion, that's the cause of their tennis elbow. I can see if they have arthritis in there, that's the cause of their tennis elbow. Now you see me passing my needle from the left to the right and getting a small amount of the injectate into that top of the tendon. Now there, I just double click the top button on the Claris. The Claris has these little buttons on them for remote control. So you can program these. This is one of the coolest things of the Claris. You can program these buttons to do what you want them to. So whether you go full screen or zoom in or decrease gain or change depth, um, and I think that's one of the really cool things that Clarius has done is they've made this software really, really nimble and, uh, and, and really user friendly. So there we go. And again, I think this is a 30 gauge one inch needle. And so again, it's really hard to see the needle, but it's such a tiny little needle. Um, uh, yeah, if you use a 22 gauge there, it shows a lot better. Now, um, if you are charting or uh, you are otherwise occupied, I want you to stop what you're doing because we've got a little bit of a quiz here. Now, we haven't covered this. I've got some free material on my own website about showing how to learn this stuff, but I want you to see if you can answer the following question. Now, if this is the medial epicondyle, the humerus, and I've got my, my thumb there, you know, um, uh, and if this is the, uh, there's a bone down here. I want you to see if you can name which bone it is. Now you've got 10 seconds to do that. And if you're uncertain, you simply take, you know, one of your fingers and place it on your medial epicondyle and take the other and say, well, it's got to be one of the forearm bones. And you know, which forearm bone is it? Well, it's a, you have a 50, 50 chance. And the answer is it's your ulna. So now uh, elbow question number two, this is common extensor tendon. Now, if this is the lateral epicondyle of the humerus over here, which, uh, which bone is this? What is this thing called over here? You got 10 seconds to answer it. And once again, you know, ultrasound is about memorizing some things, but also sometimes you just have to say, well, wait a minute, I'm, I'm, I know my landmarks, I know what it is. That's a lateral, a lateral epicondyle. And what that means is that's the other forearm bone and that's the radial head or the head of the radius. Okay, so that's the end of the elbow quiz. It's now time to move on to a little bit about the back, and then we're going to go buttock and hip, and then through the knee. So the next question there, Shelly, if you can pull up the next poll. Now, I treat lumbar spine in my clinic. You know, I started out for years. I was working with chiropractors. Now I'm mostly working with physiotherapists. Um, I work with massage therapists, acupuncturists. I want to know what do you find most helpful for lumbar facet joint pain? And, you know, strengthening is a really important thing. <laughs> you know, I've got a buddy, right? Who said, uh, hey, thanks for taking me to the mountains. I'm going out for a run because if I go for my 5K run, my back feels so much better than it normally does. So obviously exercise is one answer there. But, you know, I've had some success with PRP for lumbar facets. I've had a lot more success with cortisone for lumbar facets. And of course, a lot of people don't want an injection. So physiotherapy or chiropractic or osteopathic treatments are, are the most appropriate for a lot of people. Um, but I'm curious to see what your, uh, your findings are, and then we'll show you the results at the end of the webinar. Shelly, why don't we uh, close that off and then we'll continue on with the presentation. So in September of last year, we ran a small little uh, web, we ran a small little boot camp or a small little powwow um, in Calgary at Beam Radiology. And we, we had some VIPs come up from America. Uh, they, were, they were sent on sort of an ambassadorship by the American Medical Society for Sports Medicine. And uh, we ran essentially a, a butt pain webinar, <laughs> sorry, a butt pain workshop in person. We had about 30 docs in the, in the room and about 10 physios. You know, this is a radiologist that named Dr. Olivia Clerk. He's the founder of Beam Radiology. Here is a diagram showing the uh, superficial innervation with the superior clunial nerve, the medial clunial nerve, and the, uh, the inferior clunial nerve. And he is a fluoroscopist at heart. And he just wants to make sure that when a sport med doc sees buttock pain, they're at least thinking about spinal origin. 
Now, SI joint pain and lumbar facetogenic pain, I think are amenable to ultrasound guided treatment. Of course, if you've got spinal canal stenosis and you need to do an epidural uh, convincingly for pain management, you know, I don't think that ultrasound's the best, but certainly an SI joint, you can see where the sacrum and the ilium meet. Now, apologies to anyone who uses fluoroscopy in the group. I absolutely know that it's very hard to convincingly get into the SI joint proper with ultrasound, but at least we can do what's called a periarticular injection. And if you live hundreds of miles from the nearest major place where somebody can get a fluoroscopic guided injection, at least with ultrasound, you can get really, really close. You know, this C3 does an amazing job of showing you, even in a larger patient with less echogenic tissue, does a really good job of showing you both SI joint and lumbar facets. Now, here's a diagram that I uh, had made up for my clinic. It was an adaptation of another uh, diagram that I found in the inter uh, internet, and I had an artist change it. This is essentially saying, you know, what are the different things that can cause pain in that buttock, in that green region? And the answer is, there is a lot of things, and using an ultrasound machine to accurately guide injections can really help you work your way through the diagnostic uh, algorithm and the differential diagnosis. Now, my own personal butt and buttock pain algorithm looks something like this. The first thing I do is I examine the back and the hip and the buttock. I try to decide if the back or the hip or the buttock is the most likely cause of the symptoms. I then inject that first. And then based on the response, if the response is poor, I then moved on to the next most likely thing. And of course, please don't forget to examine the lumbar spine. And if you think that maybe something may be coming from the lumbar spine, you know, consider getting an MRI lumbar spine uh, and consider getting an MRI of their hip. Okay, so what are the types of things we can see? Well, we can definitely see SI joint. We can see the posterior hip joint with ultrasound. And we can certainly see most of these gluteal muscles over on the right-hand side. So this is an example of an ultrasound guided L4-5 facet joint and L5-S1 facet joint. Now it's going to go a little quick. Now you see one of the very cool things with the Claris is you can record yourself. Um, now this is an example where I'm injecting the L5-S1 facet joint here. One of the pitfalls is you have to make sure you're not entering a neural foramen because the, facet, the L5-S1 facet joint and the uh, S1 neural foramen do have a remarkable, remarkably similar appearance on ultrasound. So that's, I mean, that's one of the advantages of fluoroscopy, but you can still do a great job with a curved probe. I can see those bones down there, the inferior articular process and the superior articular process. We've now moved on to the L5. Again, can I see everything convincingly? No, but this is an x-ray, it's ultrasound. And I, I definitely in this patient, um, the echogenicity of their tissue matched with the C3. I, I think I can see this clearly and I can do it safely. Um, I've done hundreds of these, not thousands. I'm a sport med doc. I've not done thousands and thousands of lumbar <laughs> injections. Um, but, uh, you know, we teach them sometimes in our courses to appropriately train docs who just want to add this next step. Now, when we move on to the SI joint, so what we see here is uh, the pillar on the right-hand side is the posterior aspect of the ilium. It's sitting like this. And then on the floor here, we see the sacrum and the space between them where they meet is essentially the, the joint. Now, this is the posterior aspect of the joint. It is a fibrous part where the ligaments live. This is not the true intraarticular synovial portion. Um, that's hard to see with ultrasound and get it convincingly in with ultrasound, but we can do a great job of doing these periarticular injections. And if you're using regenerative treatment like PRP, you can get it into the ligaments for sure. Now, one of the other VIPs who came up from the from America named Dr. Elliot Hu, he works at uh, the Naval Base at Camp Pendleton. He published a study on or essentially a review paper on deep gluteal syndrome, along with the colleagues you see listed there. And when he gave our presentation for this deep gluteal syndrome workshop, he said, look, it, you must not use deep gluteal syndrome, in his opinion, unless you have excluded a pain generator coming from the spine from the hip joint, from the abdomen or pelvis, or any other possible sources. Once you've excluded those, you say, well, look, it's deep gluteal syndrome. 
And then what that means is you've got a myalgia coming from one of the muscles, or you've got an entrapment of a gluteal nerve or a cluneal nerve, you know, piriformis pain. Of course, then the lower deep gluteal syndromes, you know, coming from the obturators or the, uh, you know, ischial femoral impingement or any of the other things. So deep gluteal syndrome uh, is, is a bit of a, a bee's nest. There's a lot of stuff there. Now, can you use a Clarius handheld machine to find the piriformis and inject the piriformis? Well, what I'm demonstrating here, this is on a, um, this is on a middle-aged patient. You see my depth here is 9.3 centimeters. So it means in this situation, that piriformis is sitting at that about five centimeter mark. So the C3 actually did a really good job. Now there's different settings on the Clarius. This is a smoother image. And there's a way you can actually reduce the smoothing um, because sometimes I look at this and I say, you know, I want a little bit better definition. So there is a simple setting, a touch button setting here. And this is with the smoothing removed. Over on the left-hand side, we see the inferior ilium. On the middle there, you see the piriformis muscle sliding. So you can see the piriformis really well, even a middle-aged patient who has, as we see here, a couple of centimeters of adipose tissue below the skin, the C3 still did a good job. So that's piriformis. And just a quick reminder again about my back and buttock pain is essentially examine them, decide which one is the most likely culprit, and then inject that first. You saw the C3 did a great job of looking at it. And even sometimes in thinner patients, the L15 will do a really good job. And I've even got the L7 here. The L7 penetrates a little bit deeper than the L15. Okay, Shelly, I think we've got another question here. And I'm curious to know what you find in your practice is the most helpful for hip joint pain. Now, again, I know it's a broad question. Sometimes the answer is uh, severe end-stage hip arthritis. You know, you got to do a hip replacement. And then other people say, you know, I've got those sort of, um, uh, you know, presumed labrum tear in a 35-year-old. Uh, and I know surgery, gosh, geez, I don't know if it's the right thing to do. So do you have luck with PRP, whether it's arthritis? arthritis or labrum tears? Do you have better luck with hyaluronic acid or, you know, is cortisone the only thing that works in your practice? Or if you're a therapist and you're, you're, you know, you know, uh, is therapy the best thing for these? And in my practice, again, what I do here is I start on the bottom and I work my way up all the way to the top until, you know, I, I've offered them everything. I, w I offer them everything that I can possibly think of. And then the patients select themselves what they like the best. Okay, why don't we close that off? We'll review the results at the end. I'm curious to see what people find most helpful. For me, I think cortisone is really helpful. I've got some certainly some wins with PRP, um, and I, I refer a ton of people for arthroplasty for sure. But in my community, it's hard for the docs to keep up with everything. Now, have you ever used an ultrasound scanner? I know for those of you who use it daily, <laughs> you know, I know you have. For those of you who use it weekly, this is another question. Um, have you ever used an ultrasound scanner and you can't see what you want to the same way as the last patient? Now, this is a scan of an L, this using an L15 HD3. It's, uh, you see the femoral head here is down at about 3.2 centimeters. So this is a young, healthy female who's 24 years old and only weighs about 57 kilograms. In this case, of course, you're going to see the femoral head. Like someone like looks like that, their tissue echogenicity is impeccable. It's to die for. Now, for the next one, you chose somebody, it happens to me, be me. I happen to be 47 years old. Uh, I happen to be about 88 kilograms. And this is the exact same scanner with the exact same settings. So you can see the difference in the image. It is uh, much more washed out. It's much grayer. Now, is it deeper? For sure. But the biggest factor here is the health of the tissue. As we age, we get fibro fatty infiltration. So I guess the point there is sometimes you look at your scanner and you say, ah, why aren't you performing the way you should? And a lot of times you just have to look at the patient and you go, right. I remember that sometimes different patients look different on ultrasound. And as we age, no matter how lean you are, sometimes the, the image just doesn't look as good as when the patient was decades younger. Okay, uh, pay attention here because we're doing a hip quiz. Now, we haven't covered this anatomy, but we're going to cover it now. If this is the femoral neck, now the femoral neck is going to be attached to something when we do a hip injection. So what is this thing called? Now, we've got uh, 10 seconds to answer the question. 
Now, the reason this is important is because using uh, fluoroscopy, the fluoroscopists essentially take the needle and go straight down and touch this thing. And it's called the femoral head. Now, the next thing is, if this is the femoral head and this is the femoral neck, what is this point called? Now, you may not know this, but it's okay. You're gonna, if you're hearing it for the first time, it's important because using ultrasound, this is the point we shoot for. Now, of course, we can place the needle on the femoral head. Sometimes I do for hyaluronic acid. Sometimes that's my go-to. But other times, usually what's taught in most courses and most textbooks is you place your needle tip at the femoral head neck junction. That's where you do it for an injection. As long as you're on bone, you're good. Okay, Shelly, we've got another question here. Now, this is one of the tough things, just like gluteal pain, hip pain, pelvis pain. Um, what I want to know what you find the most helpful for hip tendon pain. You know, specifically, I mean the greater trochanter, whether it's the gluteus minimus or the gluteus medius, um, where the gluteus maximus attaches to the iliotibial band. I want to find what you find most helpful. Is it something conservative, like um, you know, some electricity on the bottom that I offer my patients first? You know, whether it's an, a thin needle with no injection in it, uh, or something like shockwave, or a, uh, you know, a massage technique called Graston, or do, is the only thing that works cortisone or PRP? I don't see a ton of my patients in my practice getting uh, surgery for this, um, but I'm just curious to know what it is in your practice. Shelly, why don't we close off that poll? We'll review the results at the end because I want to know what other people are finding is helpful. Okay, now here's an example of what you can do with your clarius. This is an iliopsoas in injection. So the way we find the iliopsoas tendon, this is in short act. So it's the ultrasound probe is essentially transverse on the body. We see the femoral head on the bottom. On the left-hand side, that's lateral. Now, this is the bit of pelvis here. That's the inferior, anterior inferior iliac spine. What we see right in the center, this big muscle right in the center is the iliacus. And down at the very bottom where the needle is touching, this is a spinal needle, where the needle is touching, that's the psoas major tendon immediately sort of fused to the hip joint capsule. And you can see with the Claris L7, this one happens to be the L7, because that was just what I had there that day when I was doing that injection. And we see this is the extended field of view. Can you see it's sort of a pyramid out or a triangle out? One of the beautiful things about uh, the Clarius product and the Clarius app is you can take your linear probe and you can hit the extended field of view and you can extend it out wider. Now, a lot of, um, a lot of regular ultrasound machines that cost 30 or $40,000 do not have this capacity with their linear probes, but the Clarius engineers baked this into the software so I can easily do something like this. Okay, now what else do we have here? Now, this is how I do a lateral hip injection. When I say that, I mean like into the painful spot where, uh, you know, someone comes in and says, hey, doc, the pain is right here on the outside. So what do we see here? Well, at the bottom of the screen is that that curve. That's the lateral aspect of the greater trochanter. Right now, the needle has passed through the iliotibial tract, and it's actually in the tissue plane under the glute max slash IT tract. Now, that's a plane where the subgluteus maximus bursa lives. You know, it's otherwise known as the greater trochanteric bursa, but you can see, you know, this is an older athlete. Um, they've got a lateral ladder hip pain, uh, but you can see the ultrasound machine does great. We can see our needle uh, quite well there. Now, this was, a, this, was a, this was a little test of mine. You know, the more videos I made to get ready for this webinar, the more I tried different things. Now, this is the C3, and this is trying to find the distal psoas tendon as it attaches onto the lesser tuberosity. And I was blown away. I did not think the C3 would perform this well. Now, I know this sounds like a sales pitch, but I'm not kidding. There on the left-hand side is the acetabulum. The femoral head is in the is a, the just on the left now. And as I scanned more distal and angled my probe, I could see that beautiful uh, line of the parallel collagen fibers of that distal psoas tendon. I mean, I've, I've got other scanners that can't do this, and I was really impressed with the C3 that it could do that. Um, that's just what it looks like when we're looking actually for the biceps tendon in the forearm. So uh, I thought that was pretty cool. Let's move on now to the knee joint. Okay, Shelly, the next poll here. I want to find, no, so just like the last question, what do you find most helpful for hip joint pain? I want to know what do you find most helpful for knee joint pain? So, uh, of course, PRP, hyaluronic acid, cortisone. Now, I know surgery is there. I refer 
I refer, unfortunately, five people a week for arthroplasty. So I know that sometimes the answer is surgery, but I also offer them everything. I've got some people and they say, look, the brace was the only thing that worked. Or, you know, the, the lubricant, that hyaluronic acid just didn't work for my knee. It didn't work for my left knee, but oh my gosh, it was amazing for my right knee. Um, so I know there's just so many different options. I like to offer my patients these things so they don't think I'm hiding something from them. So I actually use this chart in my clinic with uh, the patients so they can see the menu and they can choose things off the menu. Um, let's close that uh, poll. We'll, uh, we'll continue on with the content. We'll see what the results are later, Shelly. Now, um, what's it look like when I do a PRP injection? Now, I was trained to do knee injections blind, essentially putting my finger next to the patellar tendon and jabbing it in. Now, here's a patient of mine who continues to play soccer on a severely arthritic knee. She's been told she needs a knee replacement and she's been told, don't waste your money on PRP. And she said, you know, I've done PRP. I've done cortisone. I've done bracing. I've done physio. She said the PRP does better for my arthritic knee than those other things. So I'm going to continue using it so I can continue to play soccer until I need my knee replacement. So what do we see here? So we're transverse with the L15 on the distal quadriceps tendon. Now, again, this doesn't make a ton of sense if you've never used ultrasound for a knee injection, but as you can see, I'm going proximal to the patella. So we call this the supra patellar recess. Now that happens to be a 22 gauge needle. I'm passing it from the lateral aspect and I'm going into this black fluid pocket here. Now this fluid pocket, again, is called the suprapatellar recess. Some places it's called a suprapatellar bursa, but this connects to the, the fluid of the rest of the knee joint. So whatever you put in here, whether it's cortisone or hyaluronic acid or contrast dye for an MRI, this connects with the rest of the knee joint. You know, interestingly, we're not going to talk about Baker's cysts here, but it, it, this is also would connect with the Baker's cyst. So as an example, if I see a patient with a big Baker's cyst, I'm thinking twice about putting hyaluronic acid in here because I'm wondering if this is going to wind up in the Baker's cyst and actually not help their knee much at all. Now, here's another knee and another Masters soccer player. This is with the L15. And this is a really cool little thing. This actually is a new feature of the Claris uh, software that has artificial intelligence that can measure, it can identify your tendon and measure the thickness of it. So you simply essentially just say, hey, measure the tendon and it does it. It's got voice recognition, which is super cool. Um, now, this is a completely normal looking patellar tendon, but sometimes you'll see some partial thickness tearing and that proximal pull over on that right-hand side will be twice as thick as the central portion. Another place this is really applicable is for the Achilles tendon. So I love it. You know, I haven't seen another soft uh, ultrasound company that has anything like AI come out yet. And I think, you know, Clarice is just, I think it's cool because they're leading the way and bringing these things. And I think the way, I think the reason they're, they're bringing it to market so quickly is because it's simply an app that all they have to do is update it on the app store. And all of a sudden it's there rather than, you know, having to get your $40,000 machine connected to the internet and download it and hopefully it works okay. So that's one of the advantages of uh, running things off a, off a tablet app using something like this. Now, um, what I'm showing here is the, the over on the right-hand side's patella. Now we've moved it. So there's the patella on the left-hand side. So there's that black fluid pocket again. Now the bottom right, we see our femur. The top right, we see the um, we see the quadriceps tendon. So again, it's just so easy with ultrasound rather than fighting your way through that Hoffa's fat pad we saw earlier in the clip. All you gotta do is go proximal to the patella. You go transverse in it, and then we see that black cleft. That is joint fluid. Now, as you see, the last patient was a woman who had no hair on the leg. Now, this is a gentleman who has quite a lot of hair on the leg. So if you're scanning these, this is a situation where you do have to get quite a lot of sterile gel. Now, again, I'm taking a 27 gauge, 1.5 inch needle here and putting a little bit of fluid. 
The only trick here is sometimes when there isn't a large effusion, you know, there's that bone there. You see that needle sitting just above that white sort of mountain there. So sometimes it is a little tricky. I'm going to admit it, I'm not going to lie. Sometimes it's a little tricky to get up and over that lateral aspect of the femoral condyle, that anterior sort of bump of the femoral condyle. But once again, once you're over it, you're in. So what we're putting in here is I think this is a hyaluronic acid product. So in this case, this is a 21 gauge, 1.5 inch needle. Now I've already put in some anesthetic. So he doesn't even flinch when I go through the skin past that 21 gauge needle. And the beautiful thing about ultrasound is I can tell that I haven't taken my needle and jammed it into his quadriceps tendon. <laughs> So when I'm doing my knee injections, I'll usually find the tendon and the suprapatellar recess in long axis. I'll go back to short axis and I'll go back to long and short again. Just I'll flip flop just to make sure as I'm depressing the plunger, my needle tip doesn't travel accidentally into the quadriceps tendon because uh, man, that, that's when you get some uh, unhappy patients. Now, as they discussed, there's 250 videos, give or take in the Clarius classroom already. When Clarius came and shot stuff, there's a lot more stuff, both ankle injections, another full demonstration of the AI, a cortisone injection. Uh, there's a drainage down there in the bottom center. So if you want more uh, demonstrations about how to do it, they're in the Clarius classroom. Okay, so time to stop your charting. Uh, come on, have a quick peek here. There's another quiz on the way here. So we just covered this. Uh, in the in the video demonstration, but if this is the patella, what is this thing called? Now, I didn't actually give it the name, but I'll give you a little hint. It's a fibro fatty tissue, and it is superficial to the patella. So three more seconds. Now, the re I'll tell you the reason this is important in a second. So this is called the suprapatellar fat pad. So when we're teaching people to scan this, we say, find the patella, find the quadriceps tendon, and just attached to it is the suprapatellar fat pad. You're simply going to look below it for that black space. Now, if this is the femur way down on the bottom, what is this thing called here? Once again, it's a fibro fatty tissue. It looks really similar to the suprapatellar fat pad that we just saw. And this thing is called, well, it sits in front of the femur, so it's called the prefemoral fat pad. So the reason this is important is because the fluid of the knee is going to sit between the suprapatellar fat pad and the prefemoral fat pad. So what type of bodily fluid is this? Well, the name is simply, we know it's not tears, we know it's not uh, uh, bile, it's the synovial fluid of the knee joint. Again, it seems simple to do these little quizzes. But when I'm running those, you know, I did 38 webinars for my, my team last year. Um, running these little quizzes was a way to keep people engaged, have a little bit of fun, and make sure that they uh, learn things properly. So I hope we've been able to share a smile and interact with some of the friends we haven't met yet. We'll look at those poll results shortly. I hope we've been able to get a little bit inspired about adding some MSK injections to your practice, learning a little bit about the different types of PRP. We got the leukocyte poor, the leukocyte rich. We got the different ways to manufacture it. We saw lots of examples. You know, there's a pathway to start MSK ultrasound if you're new to it and a pathway to progress. For example, we run levels, we run boot camps between, you know, level one and four. Something that makes our courses stick out from the competition is when students come on our course, there's one machine shared between two students. A lot of times, you know, people say, you know, I went to this course and all I did was stand around. There was six of us for a machine. But for my program, sports medicine ultrasound and orthopedic ultrasound, whether you're level one, two, three, or four, there's always one machine shared between two students. Okay, so the final interactive alert. Uh, I want to thank very much the Clarius team. Now, don't go anywhere because we've got questions coming up. We've got uh, Shelly's demo. Um, I just want to know uh, where you are and what language you speak. Would you say to the Clarius team, thank you, gracias, merci, uh, danke schön, uh, grazie, obrigado. I hope I said that right. Uh, she, she, or, you know, I got a soft spot in my heart for mahalo uh, for Hawaii. So uh, I, would, I would say mahalo, of course, if I'm in Hawaii. So uh, say thank you to the Clarius team, uh, however you feel most comfortable. Um, and uh, and <laughs> of course, now when I was working with Disney, there was a silly little thing we would say, uh, y'all come back now, you hear? Um, but, uh, anyways, Shelly, let's close this off. Let's, uh, let's All move right. on. I think you've got a live yeah. demo coming. Yeah, I've got a quick live demo to do here and encourage everybody to stick around. We'll probably run over the top of the hour, but I'll just give you a quick demo 
and then stay tuned for uh, the answer to Dr. Johnson's poll questions. So I just have my model lying on his back with his um, hip just externally rotated a little bit. And I'm going to use the, um, I'm using, like I said, the C3 scanner for a nice big field of view and the hip joint preset. And that's gonna optimize our imaging. Great, so we're just gonna head down to the joint. Now, I do need to adjust my depth because his hip um, uh, is at the bottom of the screen here. So we can adjust the depth manually if we like, just by swiping up. Um, the other nice feature we have now is something called voice controls. And so I can actually, um, I know you can't see where my iPad is, but it's way over on my desk and I'm over at the bed. So I can tell the system to uh, decrease depth or increase depth, decrease gain, freeze. And so the femoral head we're seeing here and the femoral neck is here. And here's that head neck junction that you were talking about right in this area. Is that right? Jelly, can I interrupt? Did you, did you just sure. control that with your voice? I totally did. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't think any other it's, ultrasound company has that, do they? I don't. I think you're right. Yes. So That's I, can, bonkers. I can freeze my image, freeze and capture image. We have a little bit of time here, so I'm just going to quickly um, switch over my scanner to the linear to the L15 because I want to give you a quick look at the um, MSK AI that Dr. Johnson demonstrated. And so once we connect to the scanner, I'm going into the knee preset and then automatically we do see this MSK AI icon pop up. And so if I just kind of position myself, decrease step. Great. Decrease gain. So we're right over the distal patellar tendon here. And I'm just going to just turn on the MSK AI and we'll see how it puts an overlay over the uh, patellar tendon. And I can adjust the opacity of that if I like. So as soon as I say freeze, the app is going to place calipers over the thickest part of the tendon. I can adjust that if I want to fine tune it a little bit more, and then we can take an image as well. Excellent. And again, for those All who right. haven't used Clarius before, that automatically, if you set it up that way, you may choose not to for privacy reasons, but that mm. automatically gets uploaded to the uh, to the Clarius cloud, right, Shelly? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. You can save all of your presets and just pick whatever you like. That's right. So again, you'd have to Wait, check so, with your you'd have to check with your yeah. clinic administrator or hospital administrator and just make sure that uh, but but I mean that it's HIPAA compliant. It's used yeah. by clinicians all around the world that way, isn't it, Shelley? Exactly, exactly. You know more about this thing than I do. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I mean, well, I've been using this L15 in my clinic now for like a year. So um, you know, yeah, yeah. I've I've, I've learned right. to, I've played around with the app and I figured out lots of fun stuff, but there's still lots more to learn. All right, just before we get to the q and I'm just going to hand things back to Jeanette just to talk about the product a little bit, and then we'll be back to answer your questions. Thanks, Shelley, for the fabulous live demo, and thank you, Dr. Johnson, for all, sharing all your best practices. Looking forward to a lively Q&A session at the top of the hour just shortly. Before we open up the floor to questions um, in a moment, here's a quick poll. We'd like to help everyone continue their journey in bringing handheld ultrasound guidance to their practice. So please do complete this poll to let us know if we can provide further information and do click on as many options as apply. Pricing and availability does vary by region. So please feel free to request a quote and pricing. You may opt to speak to one of our experts about the advantages of wireless ultrasound. If you'd like to discuss scanner features, please select that option. You can also book a virtual one-on-one -on -one demo with our experts to see the new Claris HD3 in action in a highly interactive session. And uh, we can also send you more video tutorials on ultrasound guided injections. So please go ahead and select as many options as you wish. And while you complete the poll, I'll take a minute to introduce you to Claris HD3, the world's only third generation line of portable ultrasound scanners, now 30% smaller, lighter, and more affordable. Claris HD3 delivers best-in-class wireless ultrasound for sports medicine with an easy-to-use app powered by artificial intelligence and connected to the cloud. 
Our Claris linear scanners are specifically designed to effectively diagnose MSK injuries and guide pain procedures with superior anatomy and needle imaging. They deliver several advantages. Claris is unrivaled for near field and high resolution imaging in a handheld device. As you saw today, you get a clear view of nerves, vascular structures, other anatomy, and your needle for safe ultrasound guided injections. The secret lies in each scanner with not one or two, but eight beamformers, 192 elements and artificial intelligence that together deliver the image quality only found in compact systems, but at a fraction of the cost representing 85% savings. And with AI replacing complex knobs and buttons, it's as easy to use as your smartphone. Claris is also wireless, freeing up space with zero footprint for ultra portability in a variety of settings. You get free movement with no wires getting in the way and touching your sterile prep area. And with no wires, Claris is also so much faster to clean, disinfect, and you can fully encase it in a sterile bag. Only Claris delivers linear wireless scanners with an ecosystem that includes a free app for your iOS or Android devices for unlimited users. Available with our membership, Claris Cloud is used to easily capture and manage unlimited exams from anywhere. Your membership also includes in-app Claris classroom videos with experts like Dr. Johnson now and onboarding with a Claris clinician to build your skills. Claris Live delivers one-click telemedicine if you'd like to share live scanning with a colleague for a second opinion. And with your membership, you also get our advanced MSK package that includes dedicated presets, voice controls, um, so that you can uh, adjust game depth, capture images, all using your voice. And in the USA, there's also the FDA approved MSK AI feature that automatically identifies, highlights, and measures the thickest section of the tendons in the foot, ankle, and knee, accelerating ultrasound mastery for new users and uh, speeding diagnosis and treatment for musculoskeletal injuries. We'll now close off the poll in three, two, one. Thank you. If you ask for more information, we will get back to you in the coming week. For our last poll, we'd like to invite you to pre-register for our upcoming MSK webinar with SonoSkills educator, Dr. Mark Schmitz, entitled The Dynamic Shoulder Protocol, a Functional Assessment. For a deep dive into imaging the shoulder, please do complete this poll to save your seat for our July 12th webinar, and we'll send you confirmation email in the coming days. I'll give you three more seconds to save your seat. Three, two, one. I'd now like to welcome back Dr. Johnson and Shelly. Uh, we've reached the top of the hour, but we're gonna continue with a live Q&A session. Please use the questions icon in the menu bar to ask your questions of our great clinicians. Shelly, if I can ask you to moderate for us now. Great, thank you. One of the questions was about the length of the needle uh, that you use for um, facet injections. Yeah, super good question. The standard needle I use is 3.5 inches long, which I think is 100 millimeters. I'm Canadian. I should be able to translate between imperial yeah. and metric rapidly. I think it's 100 millimeters, uh, 3.5 inches. Uh, however, from time to time, I'll have a patient uh, who's quite slim and I'll use a 2.75 inch, which would be like an 80 inch, uh, 80 millimeter needle. Okay. Um, can we inject HA and lidocaine? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, I mean, again, this is a more of a philosophical pharmaceutical question, but I inject lidocaine prior to HA in almost every single patient. Um, not mandatory, but it's certainly for patient comfort. Um, plus it also, when you're beginning, I think that lidocaine going into the suprapatellar recess is almost like, uh, like an echo locator to make sure you're in the right spot rather than accidentally inside the tendon. And how do you prep the skin for injection? Really good question. So um, I don't use iodine. I don't use an alcohol swab. I use a product called Stanhexidine or Chlorhexidine. And I think that's probably the most common thing because I trained in America for three years and I use those little Chlorhexidine uh, breakable swabs. So some of, some of my tutors, some of those 36 docs that teach with me use little Chlorhex preps, but I use stand, pink, stand, pink Stanhexidine. Okay. Yeah, and you you use that in, instead of gel as well, right? When you're when you're doing your procedure, you don't you don't bother with the gel because the the stanhexidine works quite well for that. Yeah, whether it's stanhexidine or an, even an alcohol swab can actually work yeah. very well. St lidocaine, yeah. like sometimes if something dries out, I'll just shoot some of the lidocaine on the skin because it's a sterile uh, it's a sterile liquid. Now, obviously, when you saw that gentleman with quite a lot of hair on the leg, that's one of those situations where I think you do certainly need some sterile gel to maintain conductivity with the skin. Right. Yeah. And I've run into that too, where 
Um, if somebody has a lot of hair on their on their leg, you do get a funny little artifact at the beginning, unless you're applying a lot of gel. And sometimes you just can't get around it. So, yeah. Um, all right, I think we'll do one more here. Um, and I, I did see uh, you do this procedure in your clinic, but this question is, must we aspirate knee effusion before injection of your uh, PRP or, or HA? Super good question. Super good question. So I usually aspirate anything greater than, I'll call it six milliliters. Uh, you know, the five mil syringes actually go to six. So if I mine, in my mind, I look at it and there's greater than six, I'll aspirate it. Um, my concept there, my, my rationale is that the hyaluronic acid, I want that to be able to touch the cartilage. And if there's a 30 milliliter effusion, I think that hyaluronic acid molecule doesn't get a chance to touch the cartilage. Same thing with PRP. If I create a six times or an eight times PRP, and I'm putting six milliliters of a six times PRP into a knee joint with a 30 milliliter effusion, I've suddenly de, you know, completely diluted my product that my patient and I have paid to create. So I, I'm a big fan of aspirating uh, prior to injecting those more expensive products. Cortisone, not such a big deal. Okay. All right. Thank you for all your questions. Yeah, we've had dozens. And if you didn't get to your question, we'll follow up by email in the coming week. Um, you're going to all receive a PDF copy of the slides in the webinar recording in the coming days. I'd like to thank Dr. Johnson for sharing all his best practices and a very big thank you for all of us for joining. And now I'm going to hand it back to Dr. Johnson to go over those polls and his closing remarks. Oh, good. Because I, because I think Shelly, uh, when we were talking with the team, this is the first time we've done that many interactive polls. So this is my, as much a learning yeah, opportunity yeah. for us, isn't it? <laughs> okay. To see how well doing that many polls does. For sure. <laughs> good. Okay, Here so we go. So it looks like the first one, uh, so there are actually an awful lot of people using the Regen Lab, and, and I think that's a fantastic product to get started with. So that's really cool because the Servos Key PRP system is just coming in in Canada. Um, it's replacing Harvest. They're leaving Canada. So I'm super happy to see that some of you are using that already. Now, I know Arthrex, and, uh, Arthrex has like kind of a big foothold in the orthopedic community. Uh, and then, of course, I, I, there's lots more products uh, out there. So that's cool. I'm really glad to see that one. Now, there are also some people who are creating their own PRP in like a vacuum hood and under completely sterile conditions. So that's another way as well. Uh, now, how what works best for tendon pain? Absolutely. I think there's some people where surgery is mandatory. Um, PRP, cortisone, and other, I'm assuming, and again, we, 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 we were debating how many other options uh, to put on there. So maybe that's a, Shelly, maybe a note for future, you know, physical therapy, meaning exercises or physical therapy, uh, you know, cause, cause I love, I love getting these answers from people. Um, I'm, I am curious to see how many people voted PRP over cortisone. I guess that maybe says something about the people who say, you know, uh, ultrasound is the way to go. I think there may be some people who, when they get ultrasound say, you know what, I do think PRP is going to work better and I can see where it goes. I think my days of offering cortisone to everyone might be behind me. And I think that's fabulous because I, I don't think cortisone is the future. Absolutely not. Lumbar facet joint pain. Okay, so there are some people out there who've had some good success with PRP. Uh, personally, I've used it a fair amount, and I don't get the best results with it. So I'm 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 uh, optimistic to see a lot more people get good results with PRP. Cortisone, absolutely. I think cortisone is a gold standard that is affordable for most people. Uh, you know, oh, we should put surgery on there and see how many uh, spine surgeons we have join the webinars in future. And I totally agree with you. Physiotherapy and chiropractic treatments and manual therapies are, are, are a gold standard. They're not going anywhere because uh, not everybody likes to have a 3.5 inch long needle put in their back. Okay. <laughs> Now, oh, and I think I may have misanswered the question before when we talked about the length of the needle. Uh, the needle size, the needle gauge is a 22. I don't usually use a 20 gauge and I find the 25 gauge is just too wobbly. So uh, 22 gauge, 3.5 inch spinal needles for most facet joints. For hip joint pain, PRP, absolutely. I've got some wins for, for PRP, HA, uh, cortisone. I probably, do, I probably do eight cortisones for every single hyaluronic acid or PRP I do simply because, you know, those, those other products are a bit more expensive. The beautiful thing with ultrasound is I can say, look, if that injection didn't help, 
I, I know it wasn't because of the technique. I've got sometimes literally I've got my needle on the head neck junction, or I've got my needle tip on the femoral head. And as I push it, I see the injectate shoot back out along the pathway uh, that I just created. And when I've seen that, I thought, I wonder how many other doctors this happens to, and maybe we don't notice it. I wonder how many other doctors this happens to using fluoroscopy and we don't notice it. But that's the beautiful thing of ultrasound is as I put in the anesthetic and then also I put in the hyaluronic acid, I can see if the hyaluronic acid stays in the hip joint rather than bouncing out. So um, I think that that's a cool thing with ultrasound. Uh, next one was hip joint. Oh, tendon pain, wasn't it? Yeah, hip tendon pain. PRP, absolutely. I like using PRP for hip tendons. I like starting with cortisone. I use cortisone as sort of my truth serum. It's like, hmm, do I think I can change your pain with this really basic fundamental chemical? And I'll use cortisone as my sort of uh, truth serum, whether it's in the spine or a knee or, or a hip. And then once I've proven that putting some chemical in this tissue plane reduces their pain, when the pain comes back, I then say, look, we can do cortisone again. You can go back to physio and Cairo, um, uh, or did you want to upgrade to PRP and see if that takes away your pain better and longer? Um, so again, I, I, I all, almost always offer cortisone to everybody. Um, absolutely. This, look, this is like an even split. I think that's cool. And I think if we had other on there, you know, we put surgery and then other, you know, on there. Uh, I, I think these are really indicative of what the sports medicine, uh, you know, zeitgeist is right now. Um, you know, what's happening in the sports medicine community and people are using a lot of different products and offering the patients and we just see which patients respond. I've got some people where the left knee responded really good to PRP, but the right knee responds better to cortisone and surgery. So I think it's wonderful. We can just say, I put it in the right spot. The response is out of my hands. We'll see what we get. Oh, that's cool. We got to, we had some Germans on the crew. We had some Italians. We had some, uh, we had some Portuguese. We had some, that's awesome. Hey, cool. We had, we had some Hawaiians or Hawaiians at heart on the call. Yeah, okay. <laughs> want to be. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. In my opinion, the best way to reach new heights, uh, we just got back from the Canadian Rocky Mountains uh, with my buddy from Germany. The best way to meet new heights is to is from where you are now on your MSK journey is to find people who are going there and simply to join them. Whether it's hiking up a mountain, you want to follow the person in the lead. Hopefully they know where they're going. So <laughs> it, at Sports Medicine Ultrasound and Orthopedic Ultrasound, we're headed up to the mountaintop. So I just want to know if you'll join us. But either way, thanks for allowing us uh, to join you on part of your journey uh, for sports medicine ultrasound and on behalf of orthopedicultrasound.com. And we hope that Clarius team has inspired you to reach new heights. Uh, and so whether you're north of the 49th parallel, you know, in the United States of America or your orthopedic surgeon anywhere in the world, um, you, we invite you to visit our website. We've got some more free resources the same way uh, Clarius has some awesome free resources on their website. Excellent. Thank you very much. That was so much fun. Very interactive. I love it. Um, we really appreciate your time, Dr. Johnson, and everyone joining us today. Thank you very much. Have a great evening, and we'll see you next time.